Bandwidth for This Week in Mad Men provided by liquidweb.com. Tonight on This Week in Mad Men, Peggy gets a job offer, Megan gets a callback, and Joan gets an indecent proposal. So don't fool yourself. This is a dirty business. It's time for This Week in Mad Men. Welcome to a new episode. Welcome to a new episode of This Week in Mad Men, in which I'm going to avoid hitting my mic or doing whatever that was for the next hour. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great week for Mad Men. It was an amazing episode. It was called The Other Woman. Uh, if you want to tr join us live, if you're watching this right now live, uh, it is Tuesday night, by the way, uh, ustream.tv slash This Weekend. That is the address. Come find us. Come chat with us. We have a very active chat room that is much smarter than, than me and the panelists. Uh, well, uh, me. The, the, the panels are very smart, uh, but I'm not th a fan. they they are amazing. They do they have tons of great insights, and they sort of correct us as we go and keep us honest. So uh, really great to have them. It's really fun to join them if you're watching the show. I am your host, Lon Harris. Joining me, as always, the top build on the program, uh, Ms. Jamie Fox. I'm the best one. You are. We the top top build. I don't know. Do we do that alphabetically? I guess Harris, Haddad. I don't know. Oh, yes. We just put you. We just put you up front. And uh, for the second week in a row, uh, my brother, our new panelist, uh, Jonathan Harris. Hello. Taking the place of uh, Janie Haddad Tompkins, who could not be here tonight. Happy to be here again. And uh, at Country Caravan, where to follow him on Twitter. We'll I show up plugs. whenever they need me, like Paul Kinsey. You're exactly right. You're not not with the you Hare Krishna pipe. robes though this yeah. week. A pipe. Shave the beard. I'll be back. Right. You'll, you'll, you'll sing some of your favorites from your old Glee Club for us. Uh, it'll be great. <laughs> so uh, what, what an episode. I mean, an amazing episode last night. I've read a lot of people saying maybe the best of the series or one of the best. And I think best in some of the ways. Season, I would say, for sure. I mean, Signal 30 puts up Mystery a Mystery date, but this fight. one was, was really good. fantastic. It, it, it's hard. It's becoming hard to judge. And it I mean, was considering. It's very emotionally draining for me. Yes. And in <laughs> terms of major Mad Men stuff happening, like character driven yes. like things happening to the major right. characters this is a I mean if you think of that maybe the B plot this week was Peggy and in any other week that would have been a massively I mean if you told people at the beginning of the season that that would happen well it is it kind of sneaks up on everyone right. I think intentionally yes but uh, but still I mean that the fact that there were two storylines competing of that level of magnitude uh, and I also thought uh, it was sort of interesting that this, in some way, it's weird that there's two episodes left after this, because this, in a way, feels like the culmination of what this whole season has kind of been building up to. It's been all about sort of male privilege kind of eking away and the way that the men are reacting, sometimes violently, to the loss of their privilege, trying to sort of reassert control. We've talked about this basically every week. Uh, and now this week, I mean, an episode entirely dominated by that sort of imagery. Yeah, I think um, the main themes this week are men losing control, women earning that power, but at what cost? And right. every woman in this episode who uh, takes a bit of power for herself might have lost a little bit of something in the process, might end up regretting it. Obviously, Joan's the big one, Peggy as well, and Megan just a little bit hinted at uh, in her audition scene. Sure, yeah, and I mean, just the, the overall, even to take a step back, this idea of like the male gaze, male desire, and, and the male desire to sort of dominate and possess women as opposed to just, there's this line of, uh, and it, it comes up a lot in Mad Men and it came up in sort of culture still to this day, but at that time, this notion of, well, women have this natural advantage of like they're beautiful and men love them and men are sort of so taken with them and can't resist them. Uh, and so that's like the women's advantage and then men have to sort of, they have to combat that somehow. And so it's like sex and money and power. Well, that's how men compete with women. It, 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 pretending that it's some sort of lay of level playing field, but of course this is sort of shown to be something of a farce. Well, neither of them really, neither sex really has power all that much. Power in the sense that they can really get what they want and hold on to it long term. We've talked about that a lot, a major theme of the show. People right. yearning for what they want, it turns out not to be enough. That happens consistently throughout this season and in this episode. Um, so if women are kind of coming into that role that men have typically dominated, um, they're quickly finding out it's not all it's cracked up to be. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Um, and yeah, but just this this notion of that these women can never free themselves from men trying to sort of own them or sort of trying to possess them. And it kept coming up 
sort of over and over again, including, and I'll jump to this right away, the closing song, uh, The Kinks, You Really Got Me, which is sort of this very naive, kind of childlike presentation of these same basic ideas of the woman having total power over the man. Yeah, they drive you so crazy, you think you're, you've are you got control over them, but they've really got you. Right, so uh, we'll play a little clip from that. This is The Kinks, You Really Got Me. talking in the uh, in the studio now I mean they've gotten to the Beatles this season the Rolling Stones the Beach Boys they're really covering the gamut of popular 1966 and I radio that rock Matt Weiner being like I got all this money AMC look at me <laughs> yeah it's essentially yeah, big songs like and calling attention the to the fact that he's using big songs mm -hmm. I know at that moment when the song kicked in did anyone else think that she was just gonna fall down an open elevator shaft <laughs> that would be just, I thought that was I'm like, this oh total my God, LA law was, moment and, no I don't I don't think the light hit her the light hit her face. I, I, uh, you know, she has I this little smirk. I don't, yeah. I don't, there, there's no way they could have gotten away with that. Um, so one thing, just to take a step back, we definitely have to talk more about this issue of male possession and dominance in the gays and whatever, but uh, one thing I wanted to bring up was just how different, I mean, this felt like a classic Mad Men episode, uh, and it dealt with, the, you know, as I'm saying, like the sort of, the show's never really more eloquent than when it's about these sort of gender battles and how this sort of sexual revolution changed this atmosphere. But I also thought, unlike a lot of other episodes, it felt a little light on the sort of subtext, the stuff we usually pick apart here. Yes. I mean, there was a lot going on, but it felt it much very, more... The themes are very clear. Themes were very clear, and it was a, it was a more nakedly emotional episode. It was yes. not restrained like we're sort of used to seeing. And they made mm -hmm. no efforts, I thought, to hide what the major themes yeah. were. I mean, they did this cutting back and forth. He's talking about possessing the car, yeah. something you can really own, and it right. cuts back I mean, to, the, to the Jones sequence. It couldn't have been hit over the head more. So yeah. there's always subtext, and you've already brought up some things before we started. That, yeah, uh, well, there's a lot of little things I sort of was digging up. But I mean, that major theme of woman as possession, can you control that? Yeah. Can you own it like a car was very much uh, you'd have to be pretty dense. I right, think, and we talk a lot about the ambiguity of like, why did this character do that, or why did this character do that? And there are some of that. I, I do have a few questions about that this week. But it felt like less of that. It felt like people's motives were a little bit more plainly stated. It was really more about this very relatable thing, but also seeing how these characters we've come to know so well, you know, how, it, how it affects them, and then the emotional impact for us of having gotten to know all these people. I know the one scene that really stands out to me is, uh, when all the men are gathered together, the partners discussing how to handle the Joan thing and whether they should encourage her or not. And if you were seeing this context free, if this was not a show you've been watching for years and you've gotten to know all these guys, it would just be nakedly disgusting. It would just be this really gross scene of all these men getting together in this room deciding, you know, who's allowed to have sex with this woman and how much we pay her. And yet, in this context, because you know all these guys and you sympathize with them, it, it doesn't quite play that way, or it didn't to me. Which and is, it's being led by Pete, that snake. He's slithering his way into... Yeah, it, not, not a good episode for, for uh, <laughs> is it ever admirers of Pete Campbell. Pete, Pete hasn't had many shining moments to, to really show <laughs> this his... Was, not, this, not this season. Was this him at his ever. most... I mean, season one, he was pretty disgraceful. Was this his most disgraceful oh, performance? I mean, I, he I knows he has a child easily. with a woman he's known for years and has done nothing about it. Right. I, I mean, I, I, I want to say this is him at his most Weasley. He, he is a, a Weasley guy, but it's interesting because their initial reaction in that meeting is as everyone would be. It's just like complete disgust. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, like, they all start 
to see, A, how it could work in their favor. I mean, they all would love to get the Jaguar account. Lane knows he has to go to talk to her, again, under the guise of helping her out, but it's really just to make sure, yeah, he can't money. take out another loan or he can't extend the credit line of the company anymore. He'd rather give up a big chunk of the company rather yes. than show his well, embezzlement. Well, that, I mean, but that would be an interesting, like, Lane, obviously everybody, everybody who talks to Joan about it is trying to play her in some way. Uh, Pete obviously goes in with his completely reverse transparent psychology, reverse yeah. psychology, like, oh, they wanted something weird, but we're not prepared to give it, and, and all that. And then Lane goes in, and it's sort of this feigned compassion. I came to tell you it's not worth it, but we know his ulterior motive is he can't afford to pay her, so he needs to get out of this somehow. Yeah. Uh, I'm to ask you guys and the chat room, do you feel that Roger was un, um, uncharacteristic in this, uh, in this scene? Like, do you think he was out of character, that, that he would let her... You know, because he's clearly in love with Joan, and he cares about. Well, and she's the mother of his child. Yeah, exactly. It did so seem to think... be a shift, though. Yeah. It did seem to be like he was. He's like, I hope you told them forget about it or something like that. I hope yes. you told them out of the question. Yeah, take a hike. I think he said. I hope yeah. you told them to take a and hike. And then, like, but once then he's like, birds well, it's on, a dirty business. and once Don leaves the room, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it's he's like on. he's trying he opens to. Up to well, why do you think he? I, this was one of the questions I had. Why, why do you think Roger gives in? So quickly, because also his response is interesting where he goes, well, I'm not going to stand in the way, but I'm not going to pay for it. And he's the guy that's been paying for everything yeah. all season, including lobster at the beginning of the episode. He's the throwing episode money at everyone. <laughs> buying Again, everybody lobster. Again, being like, when is Rogers totally going to run out of money? He just throws he money just, at he's, everyone. He's, got, he's made a lot of money. And you get that great <laughs> shot of Peggy like watching Ginsburg <laughs> sort of opening the lobsters with bravado. Um, a big yeah. deal that Ginsburg uh, is eating shellfish? <laughs> oh, well, I guess his Jewish, his Jewish heritage uh, supposedly uh, forbids it. Okay, uh, what people more? giving up on their morals. Um, so going going back a bit to the sort of men and women issue, uh, I, I thought there was an, one of the interesting sort of subtexts. I know I said this was light on subtext, but here's one uh, that was interesting to me was this line between appreciating a woman and how men can well they're they're appreciating a woman's beauty versus trying to sort of own it and this idea of the whole notion of men appreciating beauty like, you know, like a fine wine is sort of nonsense or sort of not really how things are. I mean, you get it. You get it. There, there was a lot of duality in, in this episode, uh, m almost Madonna horror complex kind of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Initially, you know, Herb originally is talking about Joan in these sort of admiring ways. And then it gets to, you know, I'd like to, you know, pay for, I'd like to have sex with her. Uh, same with Megan, who's going in for a callback, an audition, and then... Basically, had, like, just, like, turn around. Treated like a, so, yeah. treated like a piece of merchandise, yeah. Uh, and then even just Don and Megan, I mean, where he's he's supportive of her and loves her and what... You feel like he genuinely does want her to succeed, but it has to be on... And his terms. His terms. He, you know. and, and then... Oh, well, I mean, uh, and we're going to get to this. I know there's so much to get into, but I feel like that's what makes the Don and Peggy moment at the end so poignant, is that this is the one woman he really did appreciate mm -hmm. in a non-sexual way. In a non-sexual way. Now, maybe way. not for her, you know, acumen at copywriting, but because she was his protege. She was his possession yeah. there in the office, and now mm -hmm. she's... Leaving. Right. You bring up Peggy, and I was going to bring her up. That was my next thing to say was the only actual relationship we see in this episode where it's a man and a woman and there seems to actually be genuine respect is Ted Shaw, who has thus far been sort of a villain in the show. But now we see the side of him that he really does. He seems to be maybe the first one who comes in right off the bat. Maybe Freddie Rumson would be the other one who's treating Peggy as a, an equal. I admire you. I like your work. I don't care if you're going to get married. I don't care if you're going to have a baby. I just want to know, you know, why do you want to come work for me? And I read your book and let's do it. He seems genuine. Yeah, he seems, but for now, he seems genuine. he has played tricks in the past to try and get it done. <laughs> he's definitely not above a prank call on occasion. As he reminds seen. me of, uh, oh, right, he was Robert Kennedy on the phone. <laughs> yes, yes, right, he was, yes. Right, but uh, I, mean, I want to talk to you about your cigarette ad, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, he reminds me of the character in Extras who's always showing up at the most inopportune time to mock. Right, Andy. the, the frizzy guy. I can't guy. remember his name on the show. Who keeps but... getting roles and Andy yeah. does. So he yeah. seems like that sleazy Pete Campbell type character at the other firm. So I'm not sure. I mean, I think he might be playing. Peggy. I think he just wants to steal her from Don. It's not about her at all. Yeah. Uh, J137 in the chat room asked an interesting question that did occur to me. Is this just, is Shaw pretending to really admire and respect Peggy just to stick it to Don? Is I he just stealing Don's, he thinks she's integral to Don's success and he just yeah. wants to get at it. 
again, and this and this goes into every what? theme I've thought about of like women earning their power, but at what cost? Is it really what they want? Like obviously Joan, uh, Megan has to turn around and and Peggy as well. She thinks she's really got one up on Don. She leaves with that big smirk on her face, but is she really just a tool? For Ted Shaw to yeah, well, that they seem in the chat room. There seems to be an overwhelming uh, mention of you know like the, the overwhelming sentiment that Ted Shaw is not really interested in Peggy for her pegginess. That this is just I'm going to stick it to Draper. Well, she's still getting the salary that she wants mm -hmm. and the position that she wants, but I I don't know. I'm not. I mean, not, it, but Don got the Jaguar account, and it I think ends it's up being what a, I think it, it goes back to a lot of what Freddie Rumson said, which is we really don't know. We really don't know how Peggy would do. He's like he doesn't say I I. He says I think you're going to succeed out of his shadow, but he doesn't. You don't really know how Peggy's going to do without Don. Yeah, Freddie Rumson pre being brought back in another symbol in in Mad Men of men who don't really have. Full control. Um, he is like right. a symbol of weakness. He can't even control. But the also, bladder. but but yes, but renewal as well. I mean, he's <laughs> he's better now. He's sober. He's still work. He's not like Paul, where he bottomed out and he doesn't yeah. do advertising anymore. Like he's the one who gets her in with Ted Shaw, and obviously his his you know it carries some weight because uh, he can get her this meeting. And she's not going to call it duck. So. And it only costs a slice of pie. And one one slice of pie. That's all. <laughs> that's all he demanded. Uh, so the the last. I do want to talk about Jones while we're on this this topic. Oh, of course, we have to talk about while you're talking about these issues of ownership and men, you know, sort of possessing women. Uh, I thought the Ginsburg moment was really one of the best in the episode, where he sees Megan come to visit Don at work. She wants confidence, so she's there basically to she seduce Don. She just comes Don. and goes as she pleases. And he says, "Yes, yeah, she uh, she just comes and goes as she pleases, huh?" And then that's what gives him the idea. He's coming up with this realization that Don, who's sort of the master of all he surveys, even Ginsburg is going like, "Oh, sir, I'm not." a manager but it's very hard to work without you here uh, but he doesn't own he doesn't own Megan she still comes and goes as he pleases mm -hmm. so I thought that that was like a key insight and really just beautifully played with him sort of staring out the at the window and yeah and that's how he comes up with the uh, the, the yeah. brilliant the idea the, the brilliant way that it was tied in this week which you don't see as much anymore the first season it was always whatever the, the product was and whatever they were going through it was sort of well, tied together they right. <laughs> if you think about it was it was always like a product that in some way reflected the themes of the episode yes. or played into the themes of the episode. Cover limit your exposure, obviously being a memorable yeah. one. Um, and the carousel. And the, the car carousel. right the photo carousel. This was again like a return to that that the, the jaguar sort of tied into the whole plot of the episode very closely. Yeah, and of course he knows Don's going to go for it. And you know that look on Don's face is like this immediate recognition. Like yeah, that's right. That's what's happening to me. Mm -hmm. You know, this one thing, I've got all this stuff, the one thing I can't really possess, let's symbolize this product. Right, it. and you see in the pitch itself, when they're pitching Jaguar, Herb, the creep, is, is nodding like, yes, I, I understand. He's feeling, at that point, maybe like he rented Joan, he can't possess Joan can't. either, no matter how hard he tried. Or, I think you could also read that as, they would have gotten the account anyway. They had the best pitch. It wasn't even close. The Joan thing, maybe didn't even need to do it. And it shows how the, the, the way men think about women in the show is that they really do equate this. I mean, there's, there's the one aspect of it's something that you appreciate and love but can't really ever fully possess. But also, they don't think Jaguars are great cars. It's this great <laughs> right. symbol, or it's this great object of beauty, but they stick. They don't, like, what's Bert say about them a few weeks ago? They don't, they're lemons, lemons, they don't run. And then Don makes the point again. He goes, most cars, they give you a typewriter when you're buying this one, they give you a toolkit because it's yeah. constantly breaking down. And it yeah, seems you like the way have men, to have another car. It seems like the way men would talk about women at this time. Like, oh, you need a toolkit for her. <laughs> she, you know, like. Well, they, right. I mean, that's exactly what they're saying is like, your wife is the sturdy, reliable, you know it'll get you where you go. It's a Bu Buick in the garage, <laughs> as Megan said. Uh, and I love that scene too because the, the, the idea that it's not a put on like Megan really was good at this like yes. Don goes home and asks her advice at the end of the day like she's she's still sort of a collaborator in mm -hmm. the world. I really like that that moment there that they didn't and she drop got snarky and was like uh, here's a tagline for you it's not my problem yeah right yeah Jaguar yeah not my problem um, yeah but I, I just thought it's, it's interesting that she's still <laughs> sort of staying one foot in that world and still coming still capable of coming up with good ideas similar ideas to what they ended up going she with she was good yeah, yeah. No, and she's I, still threatening when yeah. she comes into that office. I mean, that's mm -hmm. another thing. That well, it's Stan, I think, is the one who says, you want to you throw us some ideas? Yeah. You want to throw mm -hmm. something up on the board? Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about Joan actually making her decision, because I thought this was one of the interesting, more ambiguous elements this episode. We get that scene with the fridge, which is yeah. both to reinforce Gail, Joan's mom, sleeping with Apollo, the fix-it <laughs> guy. Uh, and that, that's sort of a subtext to that scene. But 
Also, uh, I think you know it, it's there to give her a clear motive. It's like she needs the money. She's supporting this 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 she's, family. She's not accepting money from Roger because she doesn't want to be under his thumb. Right. She yeah. says that uh, also fifty thousand is four times what she makes, which means she makes about twelve point five, which is a good salary back in then. But now we're seeing Peggy getting offered nineteen thousand. So obviously there's there's room to grow. Uh, I looked it up. Peggy's salary nineteen thousand a year in 67 would have been about 120 grand today. So it's, it's, it's real money. I mean, he's offering her, it would be six that's, figures that's, today. That's uh, significant. Um, so anyway, there, there is definitely this yeah. idea that's reinforced during the whole show that it's purely, she just wants the money, or as Lane says, maybe the, the security that the money would bring, like that's enough to keep a woman and a child comfortable. But is there, I mean, is there something else too? Is it, is it a taking the power back? That she's, she's a character we've seen being raped. She sort of hasn't been in control of her own destiny with men, and now it's this, she's making this decision, all these men have to come to her, and she's the one who gets to be in the driver's seat? I mean, I think it's different. I mean, it shows the uh, duality between this week and last week, where it was men who needed money. It was Lane, it right. was uh, Paul, but they like, but Paul didn't take the money right away, and then eventually he did. It was more like a means to an end, whereas it means this specific move up. Uh, for for Joan and for Peggy, it's like mm -hmm. you are really moving up in the world. Whereas Lane just needs money to get rid of his. Like, he's dead. He's got to pay his taxes. Yeah. yeah, I mean it. It, it means a different thing uh, to the men in the previous episodes and the women in this episode. Right, but I mean this is still her taking a positive step, making a decision that then gets her financial security, gets her the leadership position that she wanted. I mean I do feel like that's part of the idea here is that. It was not just she, now she's making money off of this. I mean, I think it's it also depends. a now well, she's the one she who's going in to control. Move, like she was, no, she, I don't think she would ever become partner otherwise. Like she always would have just remained the head. Not at Sterling Cooper. Yeah, Cooper exactly. Price. Yes, probably, and and because she's the office manager or and whatever, it's not like she could she just had. bop somewhere else. Yeah. I was so um, Elaine and I were discussing this. I don't know if she's in the chat. She room. is in the chat room. She yes. had she had a brilliant theory that um, <laughs> there's three like. Megan, Peggy, and Joan represent the three ways that women are going to be able to get power. Yes. Megan has married well. Mm -hmm. That's how she can do whatever she wants to do. Peggy actually earns it. And Joan uses her sexuality. Well, I think, but that, that's interesting. And I agree. And I think that's, that's a very salient point. But I also think it's interesting that there is this, there's a cloud over, over both Joan and Peggy in this yeah. scenario, which is... Peggy may have gotten this job because Chagall wants to, or Shaw wants to stick it to Draper. So it may not have been entirely her ability. Oh, I think it probably is. And then Joan, she's using her sexuality, but only because it's in this weird case and Lane is sort of up against the and wall. And she wishes she didn't have to. Right. She's so, been there for years and she knows, based on my merits, I will never, you know. Even, even sleeping with one of, even sleeping with Roger Sterling. Didn't and very much, you know, yeah, like, I, there, there was, she had a chance with Lane, and, Don, you know. And Megan could have just married Don, and then, well, now I'm going to be the rich man's wife. She could have been Jane. Yeah. Uh, and she wasn't. She first she was working with Don, now she's doing her, doing something else. So, I mean, it, 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 I agree with the theory, <laughs> but I, I do think there's more going on. It, it's not, well, man, it's never quite so, quite so cut and dry. The question I would like to ask while we're on the topic of, of Joan's decision in the chat room is if Don hadn't showed up, if she hadn't done it yet, right? And if Don, Don had been up, on time, yes, mm -hmm. would she have still done it? I say, I think yes. I think her mind was already made up, and but and the way she closed her eyes right after he said that, like, oh goodness, like at first you think it's relief, but then you realize she's already done it, and she's like, oh, I thought it was unanimous. Or she's just, I mean, it, it's exactly what she says to Lane earlier. Like, none of the men in the office can understand why this would be embarrassing for her. Like, Pete's totally clueless. And remember, Pete also at one point tried to talk his own wife into sleeping with someone so he could get a story published. So right. Pete clearly doesn't really see what's wrong with this. No. It's like, and Pete said that horrible thing about, like, we, um, there's been nights where you can make mistakes for free. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, like, and for Pete, it's just yeah. like, ah, oh, sleep with somebody, and then we get the account. Why, why not? And uh, Lane too isn't really grasping. He's grasping why she might not want to do it, but he's not grasping like why she would feel embarrassed that all the partners got together to talk about whether she was going to sleep. Yeah, with they all just go in and talk about yeah, it, knocking on her door. And now she's really... a partner, but they all know she's a partner because of what she did. Right. You know? and, I, so and, I, how, so... and so I thought that was her face sinking is like, oh, I'm going to have to have another conversation about this and everybody's still gonna talk about this. This is never gonna go away. This is always gonna be a thing now mm -hmm. around the office that I'm gonna have to deal with. Um, 
One more thing I thought was interesting, just while we're talking about this, uh, those sequences, was Cooper's comment. Uh, after they've sort of made the decision, offer her the 50K, Cooper says to Pete, well, just make sure she knows she, she could still say no. And it's like, well, of course. Yeah. She could, nobody just, was suggesting she can't say no. That's just for Cooper being useless. Yeah, I mean, even time. Pete was not <laughs> implying they should compel her physically to do it. Of course, she was always free. <laughs> Cooper, say no. I mean, Sterling's well, not useless just because <laughs> he's great at whining and dining people, or else he'd be useless. <laughs> Cooper is completely useless, and yeah. he wa it's like he walked out at the end of fourth season. Why are they not bringing this up? <laughs> he left and quit. Yeah, and now he he's took just his shoes with him. Yeah, he yeah. said it was. Vi I mean, it was just for that joke at the end. Of, like, I didn't think he'd be the first to go. Yeah, but I mean, he comes back in and they're just like, well, his name on the door. Let's just let him back. Uh, Daytona Tracy in the chat was saying they were they were basically all for Joan doing it. So what's the big deal now? I mean, I think obviously it is still a big deal that they're all. It's it's like that that second class citizen status mm -hmm. that well she's a partner but with put the asterisk just like Pete has been pushing up against like he's a partner but with that asterisk of his name isn't on the wall. He's a junior partner. Uh, and I think borrow money. There's yeah, and I, and I think there is still that idea of like there's partners, and then there's like other people we've sort of had no choice, uh, you know, to. And like with what we were talking about earlier with Don and Peggy, is there a cloud over what they've done? I mean, I think it's going to depend on whether or not they regret it, and. You know, they'll make mention, just like they do in Mad Men, they might not mention this specific incident again for a year, but it's going to come all, back. I mean, Joan's rape was a huge issue they in the show. They didn't mention it for three years. It doesn't get brought up very often, yeah. And Peggy has a child still mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> like, it's just like. You know, I, I, one of the recaps I read pointed out all the similarities between Peggy and Joan, saying that like they both have children with uh, partners of the firm. Ooh, that's true. And that they both started out as secretaries and now work their way up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and, oh, I mean, and they it, both have mothers that are in the, that they don't get along with. And that, that, that and that shot. I think the. Mm -hmm. The, the shot of Peggy leaving, and she's at the elevator, and the only one who sees her, who actually n notices that she's leaving, mm -hmm. is Joan. There's a moment yes. of Joan watching her sort of walk off, and it does, it creates in your mind this connection between the significance of these two characters, mm -hmm. and Joan has earned her place among the partners. they have, they have very few partners. moments together, but when they do, they're spectacular. Right, and they were well, just so much of the beginning of the show. I mean, they were the first mm -hmm. two yes. characters we got to know and got to see together. Well, and it's also Joan looking at this person. She knows immediately what's going on, and she thinks, oh, here's someone who really did earn her way. I mean, well, she does, doesn't know does that Joan, Peggy's yeah, going to earn. Yeah, she doesn't know that Peggy's leaving. Yeah, I don't think she knows that Peggy's leaving. No. I mean, she's, but, I, I mean, I think she senses, look, she's got her bag on, mm -hmm. she's walking out of the place while everyone else is celebrating. Yes. There's something going right. on, and she's like, I yeah. wish I was that and Ludo person. says it in the chat room, Ludovica, and I totally agree. By the way, you're saying, Joan feels, Joan's suddenly trapped, Peggy's free. They're that looking beyond yes. the glass wall. Uh, mm -hmm. It's exactly what we saw with Pete and Peggy yes. looking at each other through that glass partition. Uh, Last season. Yes, and that, that Peggy's leaving, and Joan is now fully mm -hmm. entrenched in this group. Um, and also, one more uh, connection. Peggy has that scene with Don, which we'll obviously talk about more when she actually quits. Uh, and she, she refers to Don as her mentor and uh, you know her her champion. And if you recall, season one, her first mentor at Sterling Cooper was Joan. Mm -hmm. It was Joan telling her, mm -hmm. "Here's how to manage being a secretary. Here's how to you know get in with the right people mm -hmm. and whatever." And so he, she was her original. She sort of switched mentors over time. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about you know we we talked a lot about male the male gaze and males wanting to possess women and how clearly this was tied in through the whole episode with advertising itself and sort of an indictment of what they do and is this basically what they're doing every week just in slightly different dressed up somewhat differently obviously they're not sleeping with clients every week although it did come up uh, a lot of uh, viewers even in the chat room were talking about it and i read it too uh this exact same situation happened with sal and lee garner jr yes mm -hmm. and don was furious with sal for not sleeping with mm -hmm. lee garner jr to keep the lucky strike account happy and a lot of people were saying, like, is it, oh, yeah. is it inconsistent that now he's upset that Joan would do the thing he was telling Sal to do? Uh, I think it's different. His relationship with Joan, what uh, male to female yeah. sex is to him and what male, what gay sex would be to him, which is like, you know, the, their attitudes about it back then was just like, oh, they had... Sex yes. With no. With Don and, and Joan, it's more, and with all the women in this episode, Don can't control. He thinks he can control these women, and he can't. I think that's part of it, and I think it is definitely comes down to a gender that he's just mm -hmm. not against the idea of males having yeah. casual sex with one another as he is about 
a woman sort of prostituting herself to a client. They, uh, sorry, they did bring back, though, and you mentioned this earlier in the season, he wasn't on camera, but the Chevalier Blanc guy, the, the yeah. gay Rick. account guy, Rick. was on the phone. Yes. yes. Very, you know, noticeably, and then Peggy does that riffing to save well, the account. A, thank you for tying that in, because that's exactly where I was going. Uh, with, with, <laughs> there's so many examples of women being bought, treated as consumer items, hooked up in the pitching and the advertising yes. itself. Obviously, the Jaguar mistress curves and then you know you skip past the flesh and playboy to oogle this car and uh, i can't i can't put a woman on this account can't you know. put a right uh julia megan's friend julia up on the desk acting out being a jaguar while the guys hooting hooting holler uh even even Ted Shaw and Peggy writing down the price and handing it back and forth, like her sticker price for what she's worth. What about and the Lady Godiva image? And the Lady Godiva pitch, which is she's as naked as we're allowed to make her. But the Lady Godiva ends up being more like of the hero of that of the ad. Like it's true, but it's it, still. Yeah. It, it, I mean, even Peggy's ideas still revolve around using a woman's yeah. sexuality. Uh, so I think I think the question I think this. Would, oh, and one more one I want to bring up. Rick on the phone from Chevalier Blanc goes, "Why would a man buy a woman something for Valentine's Day?" Which doesn't make sense because it's so transactional. It's well, a man's buying a woman gifts and then she's mm -hmm. going to give it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what Valentine's Day means. And so Rick is like, well, why? What would be the motive? Why would a why would a woman even buy a man something? She's not trying to get anything out of him. That's what Valentine's Day is for. So just this, uh, you know, the, this layer of selling sex and and selling these ideas of possession is really what they do. I mean, it's the day to day of Sterling Cooper, uh, Draper Price, and 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 uh, I have another point about Lady Godiva, unless somebody wants to throw in something else about that. No. I all the historical references to yeah. legendary, historical and legendary women. I counted four. I'd be, I'd be delighted if somebody in the chat room had, had more, because there might have been more. I think three. So. Pete references Cleopatra. Yes. Uh, who, and, and all these women have a lot in common, which I'll get to in a second. Herb references to Scheherazade and Helen of Troy. He yeah. first says, I feel like the Sultan of Arabia, mm -hmm. which is a Thousand One Nights reference. And then he, he says, uh, and I'm sitting here with Helen of Troy, and then she points out those are two different stories. Uh, and then finally, Peggy's pitch, which involves Lady Godiva. Uh, and all of those women have so much in color. They're, they're all beautiful, and they all sort of use their beauty and their sexuality to attain power, wealth, fame, infamy, to get what they want. When did the Elizabeth Taylor Cleopatra movie come out? It would, have been, a few, it would have been a few years before this, I want to say. They it didn't would make, already uh, have come out. To it, but. And a, 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 a notable box office flop. Yeah, because that was a huge <laughs> made, made But it was still very, still very famous, and it had like Elizabeth Taylor, who was one of the most well respected. And, it would and definitely have been a known. Time. It would definitely have been a known commodity at this time mm -hmm. among these characters. It would have been a very famous, uh, famous movie for them. But yeah, just so many connections between those particular historical women and how they all use their sexuality to sort of get what they want. I mean, obviously Cleopatra. First, she was ruling with her brothers, who she was sleeping with both of them, and then Julius Caesar, and then Mark Antony. Uh, Helen of Troy, obviously kidnapped by Paris, kicks off the Trojan War. Uh, Scheherazade has to uh, keep telling stories to the Sultan so he doesn't cut her head off. Uh, because he would marry a virgin, sleep with the ones, and then... I'm just writing down Wikipedia entries I have to go to tonight. I'm just then, writing down uh, things to look at. And then Lady Godiva opposed her husband's taxation of the citizens of Coventry, so they made this deal that I will ride through the town. So there's a little uh, world nude. history slash mythology with See, long you guys, hair. Uh, you guys just learned a little something. <laughs> and, interestingly enough, the Lady Godiva... Uh, last thing I'll, I'll, oh, I have two more, but uh, the Lady Godiva thing <laughs> is interesting because uh, it gave birth to the notion of a peeping Tom. The rule was, she's going to do this, but y'all have to keep your shutters closed and nobody look at her. And then one guy, this tailor named Thomas, looked at her huh. and they gouged his eyes out. He was the first peeping that. Tom. And it, also in this era, a great uh, film by Michael Powell called uh, Peeping Tom. Called Peeping Tom, that's right. That was, what, 1960, 61, something like that? Uh, I guess several years before, but that's yes. a great movie. It is a great movie. Separate time. Uh, and then also while we're talking, just real quick, uh, historical references. There's a bit like when 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 Don is kissing Peggy's hand, this very chivalrous image of the lady and the knight sort of uh, kissing hand. Although, Although she puts her other... hand out for a handshake. Yes. Th right. She puts her and, and which mirrors uh, Pete tries to shake J Joan's hand. She refuses. Like 
put her there. D, you got a deal. And then she doesn't. She but doesn't it's also, her. I'm shaking my hand like a man would do. Don's going to kiss it. You're mm -hmm. still a woman. Right. Yes. In, 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 well, I mean, and then I mean it means even, much more than yeah. that. It's, very, it's also very touching. Right. But let's not forget. And it recalls the suitcase, too, where they, they're holding hands mm -hmm. when or they wake the pilot, up in the morning. Whenever she initially was, like, put her hand upon his. And because yeah. she was, that was, she was told, like, that's what you need to, be, to do. And then yeah. he refused her. I don't like that. Lot, lot going on. Um, so uh, another another theme I want to go over briefly. Uh, there's so much. There's so we're 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 over halfway through the episode. We're never going to get to all my notes. But uh, I, I think a, a big theme as well this week is sort of a sub theme would be unsustainability. That there's a lot of scenarios going on now. And obviously this is a show that's gearing up towards the end of the season. We only have two episodes left. Uh, so obviously they're setting up a lot of conflicts that are going to play out. But so much of this week was about either revealing unsustainable lies, like this lie is now so obvious that we can't even pretend anymore, or just situations that are about to blow up in somebody's face. Lane most notably, his financial troubles are now at this point completely unsustainable. Cooper puts the yeah, kibosh, there's, there's no, no bonuses. more bonuses. Yeah, there's no bonuses this year, but next year. Next year, yeah, yeah there's, so there's there's no more bonuses, even though he sort of maneuvered his way around having to give Joan 50 grand. It's a great mm -hmm. obvious line from Lane, too, by the way. He's like, I say let's just get our bonuses <laughs> and give the bonuses. Yeah, he's getting a lot worse at it's pretending that it's, like... it's an innocent thing of wanting <laughs> to give people bonuses. But also, um, I thought the scene with Peggy and Ken, it was one of two very brief and, and, and odd scenes. The, the one, Megan's audition is extremely brief. It's a very short mm -hmm. scene. And the other one with, uh, with Peggy and Ken, where he comes in and he's like, I'll get you to Paris or we'll go somewhere else yeah. together. And she goes, save the fiction for your stories. Very cutting. I have a third brief odd scene, which oh, is yeah. Pete reading to his oh, yeah, child Good at night, home. Moon. He's reading Good Night Moon. He gets in this little argument with Trudy. His relationship well, with Trudy has nothing to do with the episode, and yet it's... That's a second scene. Him fighting with Trudy is actually a second scene. So there scene. were two scenes in there, but they were yeah. very much like off from the main A and B stories of this episode. And I couldn't tell whether it's just tying in with all of the other Pete stuff going on this season and mm -hmm. his his unhappiness. His I mean, he's he's upset about having to yeah. commute. They show the the thing in the clip. It's an he epic poem for him to get home. It's an epic As poem, says, which yeah. goes in with all this about historical context. He's trying context. to get that apartment so he can like bone whoever he wants. Yeah, but right. still, there's no there's no one in his eyes in that this episode. Yeah. He's like trying to get this apartment. He doesn't even have a target yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it, it, again, it's and he says that line. Uh, he's exhausted from putting his foot down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and which that's, is great. It's again, it's it's that he has no. And Seinfeld would say he has no hand. He has no hand. He's yeah. out of hand. Like he, she just, she just dominates him. Yeah. I mean, she says, "I'm not moving. Uh, we, you've got to get over it. Your love affair with Manhattan is over. Your love affair is with Manhattan is, is over." Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, the scene opens with this very resonant image, if you recall, back from uh, I believe it's Signal 30, where he's so proud of his hi-fi and he's playing it for Ken and he's showing off, and now he's reduced to listening to it. Right, he's oh, got his yeah. headphones on. He can't play he can't the music out loud. And Trudy even comes in and says, you know, you can listen to it out loud, and he's eh. It's not worth it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Pete has nothing going for him right this season. I mean, everyone I talk to says he's going to jump out that window. He's going to get in a car accident. <laughs> I don't think um, Mad Men is that oh, hit you no. over the head with no. it. You know, when but I the was car thinking to Christina Hendrix, this is exactly what she was saying because we were talking about Pete <laughs> and how and they're foreshadowing like him going to kill himself, and she was like, she's like, you talked with Christina Hendrix about Pete. Yes. Pete Campbell, of course. He's but fascinating. I talked about the show. She loves to talk about the show. I'm he's, jealous. He's fascinating. <laughs> uh, also, I love Pete using the uh, cliche, put my foot down, because it comes from bicycling yes. and, and a car. You would, that's how you brake. <laughs> and he's a terrible driver. So he can't, he really can't put his foot down. He really grasps Oh, wow. That, huh? that's, uh, no, that, that works. But I mean, I yeah. always think of that term as something like angry husband saying, well, it I'm is. I'm putting it, my but, foot down, the foot is and down. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not down. positive. It's going down. Yeah. Going down. Putting my foot down. I'm, I'm not positive that's the origin of the cliche. I didn't, I didn't research that, but it just seems like to, to brake, break, to, stop, to put on the yeah. brakes is to put your foot down. Someone's gonna, someone in the chat room is going to find a reference in the if, 1850s if, if before in the there were breaks. If has a reference that's not that for the origin of that cliche, I'm, I'm it all It comes ears. from old Germanic, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steel Wheel's not in the chat room this week, so I don't Aww. know. He's he'll... not? No, no. He, he, Tuesdays he, don't work for him. Yeah, oh. he wrote me. He couldn't, he couldn't make it. Oh. Uh, but also, more... I know, I just made that up. <laughs> he, he really couldn't make it. Um, <laughs> more, that's, more that's unsustainable, uh, Don and Megan. I think the Don and Megan situation is essentially now at an impasse. I mean, I don't know. And 
we were talking about this last week too. Yeah, four straight weeks of arguments now. Yeah, and the, the, I've, it's gotten to the point now where it's like they're on screen, and I'm like, shut up, shut up. I don't care. Get to something else. I don't care. Well, but it's got to be leading. It's got to be leading somewhere. And, and we're now at the point that it is completely intractable. It's that yeah. she will be an actor. She's determined. Yeah. She won't give up on her dream. Being an actress is going to involve traveling all over the place. Mm -hmm. And Don straight up is like, no, don't go. And then. Eventually, Softens. she's like, mm -hmm. I'm basically going to go. And he's like, well, go, okay, do whatever the hell you want. Um, so yeah, he, he, where, where can this possibly she's go? She's going to get a role. She's going to meet mm -hmm. someone. She's going to sleep with him. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> seems, what I've been seems, saying. seems like it could happen. Uh, and then he's I thought, not going to cheat on her. He's made it perfectly clear. And as, as long as we're talking about things that are unsustainable, and I think this may be a symbol that becomes important in the coming weeks, it was a very brief scene, I think a blogger pointed it out and then I noticed it. Uh, when you first come into the writer's room and they're horsing around, yeah. they're actually building a house of cards. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. Ginsburg and the other guys are doing to pass right. the time. So I mean, a, a perfect metaphor <laughs> for none of this stuff is going to last. This is all going to topple very soon. Uh, I, know, I mean, I saw that during the mm -hmm. episode and I totally like, that, I forgot mean, it, about like, it. Like a really, really fascinating. Uh, See, there was you guys stuff think. to pick apart. No, there, of course there was. And also Dale is in those scenes. I miss yeah, copywriter Dale. Dale, who we, Dale gets like one big scene a season. The last time I think we saw him was uh, the guy walks into an advertising agency where he gets covered in blood from the yeah. spray. I don't know if we've even seen or heard from Dale since well, then. Both of the, the, so both of those guy, old guys weren't new, but one of them was. There were some, well, there's freelancers. There's, there's, yeah. there's freelancers yeah, the in that freelancers. room. Don, so we've got tons of freelancers in there. So there's not, four freelancers, right? Yeah, so you haven't met all those guys, yeah. but Don, Dale, the guy with glasses, like, yeah, what was not was clear about, he's going on a break. You're not going on a And break. of course he hires these like old men to do mm -hmm. it. Right. Like, well, that, that try was... to sustain some of what it used to be. Well, because women can't be on the uh, Jaguar We count. can't put a girl on the Jaguar no. count. But uh, that was a theme like this whole episode of these rooms mm -hmm. full of men making decisions about everybody else. And, and you know, women are not allowed into that sort of zone. Um, and that, that brings us also to uh, a major theme this week, which we've already touched on, so we can, we can skip through this quickly, uh, of Don just being ineffectual. I mean, Scene after scene after scene after scene of this week was just Don trying to exert his power over women, mm -hmm. especially, and just just coming up coming up short. And we open with that image of Dale telling the other guy, "Oh no, he's taking a break. We're not reinforcing Don's power. That Don still has all of this authority and power. He's still the big shot. Everybody still, you know, Ginsburg goes in. You know, I know, I know I'm not a manager. And yet, then the rest of the episode, he's." repeatedly unable to get yeah, his way. Yeah, with male employees he can, but not women. Well, and not even his colleagues. I mean, in the beginning, he wants the board to reject the idea outright, uh, and then he leaves, and they decide it against him, and Pete later says, the conversation doesn't end just because you leave the room. Uh, he tries to stop Joan from going through with too it. Too late. He's too late. He tries to keep Megan from moving to Boston, but it doesn't work. She says, well, this is the way it works. Now you know. Just this ultimate, like, he's just going to find out about it after the fact. He's not part of the decision making at all. Um, he tries to stop Peggy from leaving uh, Sterling Cooper, obviously, and money. He, he, he tries to do the Roger Don, throw <laughs> money at it. It's the second time he throws money at her in the episode, yes. uh, and it, it does not work. There's no, there's no number. There's no number. Th but the, this leads into something I want to bring up really quickly, which is um, Don's only victory in this episode is he wins the Jaguar account, but it's not his victory, which he learns. Yeah. And it's this whole thing, and I, I, I feel like you guys in the, the chat room might be able to help me out with this. There's been a bunch of times this season where victories have actually been defeats. So yes. Don gets the Jaguar account, then he realizes it's because of Joan, not because of him. Mm -hmm. It's a defeat. Um, the other things I picked up were uh, Pete gets together with Beth, but that ends up not being mm -hmm. uh, the victory he thought it was. And Betty learning she doesn't have cancer is actually a oh, loss. Oh, right. And then she's, but she's, now she's just fat. She's, now she's just fat. Right. So mm -hmm. if she had cancer, well, at least it would, she's not just fat. I got, I got one more. Megan wins the Heinz account and only realizes she doesn't really care about any of this stuff. Yeah. In fact, that scene with Don, like, oh, I'm not in the mood. And then Megan, it even happens in the exact same spot in the office. Everybody's mm -hmm. celebrating in the conference room, and they're just standing outside, like, realizing it's sort of empty. Right. And it's not just the pitfalls of materialism and consumerism. It's that people actively pursue things that they think are not going to be just material possessions, but things they actually want, achievements in life. And they mm -hmm. end up not really being, uh, they end up being failures. And yeah. it's happened again and I again. I mentioned this last week. You did? Yeah. Sorry. No, and it, it, no, no. Say, it's, it's, it's a good point. Fine. I wrote it down. I thought it was my original <laughs> thought. <laughs> it was very, very insightful. Uh, and, and I think we're also following this weird kind of timeline of 
these these men especially have been realizing they're slowly like losing their power, they're losing their position. Um, earlier in the season, they were reacting violently. That was the theme that it was like chasing women around the office mm -hmm. or whatever. It was all this this murdering violent imagery. Now it seems almost like it's become resigned acceptance, and you know that it's now Don staring at this empty elevator shaft or Don kind of having his forehead veins bulge when Peggy leaves his office for the last time. It's like, now they've realized that it doesn't do any good to fight it. It's just, well, things aren't going to go back to the way they were. We, we sort of lose this round. So I thought that was, I thought that right. was an interesting dynamic going on in this, uh, in this episode as well. Uh, okay, what, what more? The Peggy scene? Uh, well, I, I now, now I've got all my very specific Joan notes, which we haven't even gotten to yet. Uh, I thought Ken's line to Pete, Pete, uh, at the original dinner where they're taught, you know, the, the Herb first pitches his idea, which I also liked. I thought it was interesting that all of Herb's dialogue is, it's all antiquated. He sounds almost like Burt Cooper. He's, she's, he saw a dynamite redhead built like a B-52. Antiquated <laughs> terminology, even in 67. Uh, and then later in Betty tells her, you're a, you're a hell of a gal. Yeah. It's all this really old, it's just dating him. He's a relic. You know? Yeah. It's just making him even older. And also, I was I was He's a little mobbed up to me. Like, he may have some mob ties. Oh, that, where did you, where, where? I don't know, just the way he spoke. Just the, the suit or whatever? Because also, <laughs> I, I, was, I was wondering I if they were pretty There was also a lot of discussion of his physical, like Joan asks Pete, how is yeah. he? And Pete keeps insisting, oh, no, he he's not that bad. He calls him handsome, the, the, the handsome gentleman, you know, like I think earlier. Uh, so I wondered if they purposely cast a like, kind of a kind of a fat, unappealing looking sort of glorious We'll talk about his individual. name. Oh, yes. Well, this, I, I was very proud of, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't, come up with this, but I was very proud of the Mad Men writers for thinking of it. Uh, Herb's last name, this was the LA Times blog pointed this out, by the way, very astute. Herb's last name is Rennet, R-E-N-N-E-T. They mention it twice in the Odd show. last name. Rennet is, means a, a group of enzymes that are produced in mammal stomachs that are used in cheese production. So it's, it's bile. I mean, he's yeah. literally named bile. That's the word they chose yeah. for his last name. He's a hideous person. And Ken tries to be like, well, I know some redheads. Maybe I'll introduce you. Like well, the same Ken's thing he would have best. always done. Yeah, Ken's, Ken's trying his best. Poor Ken is like the only. Ken's he's the got only a moral. one with morals. Yeah, yeah. the and only one has never cheated on his wife. Yeah, but yeah. Again, he loves his wife, but he can't operate in this. Yeah, world. I, th I think that's an interesting point to jump off of, though, because yes, Ken comes out better than a lot of other people, mm -hmm. but Ken has the opportunity at that dinner to say no. He he could go. No, she's married. She would never do that. Let me set you up with another with another no, redhead. They he tries, escalate it. He he throws it out there. He 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 sort of indicates maybe this isn't such a great idea, mm -hmm. but he leaves the door open for Pete. And that, if you realize it, it over the course of the episode, at first the door is just being left open mm -hmm. a little bit. It's like, well, I don't think it's gonna happen. But Jen does uh, the you same thing because she says like you can't afford it. Right. Leaving the door yes. open. Joan never Pete, outright says yeah. no. And no. Pete's like, well, this was an act of desperation. It, it, it's always like leave it open mm -hmm. and then over the course of the episode it's left more and more open yes. until it becomes almost inevitable yeah. that there's no way she could turn this down yeah and i thought that was interesting that you know how she's the yeah. pressure sort of mounts right before she ever says no all of a sudden lane puts it out there five percent of the company i'm a partner you can get it well that's significant yeah it is i mean it, you know five percent of that five percent of that company over, over that's what i'm saying yeah. someone offered me that you know it's a you tough sleep with her brennett well i don't know <laughs> but i mean i don't know what the female equivalent is but i'd still be you know that's Jackie a lot Bates. of money and then uh what did you guys think that's poor miss Bates. <laughs> <laughs> what did you what did you guys think of uh pete's line when he's done pitching uh junk she's like you're a real you're a piece of work or whatever uh, and he goes, I hope I haven't insulted you. That's all that matters to me. I and mean, he's just, he's completely delusional. <laughs> he can't tell how he's come off still. Even at the end when she's There's just like a trail insulted. of slime off of it comes off of Pete. <laughs> it seems like Pete, to be good at his job, would have to be pretty good, reasonable at reading signals well, mm -hmm. and reading people. No? But that's the thing is, this is the what he does with men. And men fall for it yeah. because he does this whole, like the, the sleazy thing where like, well, I can introduce you to this lady and such mm -hmm. and such. It works really well with men. It does not work well with women at all, which shows he is not going to... Uh, be very effectual in the future world where he's going to have to manage accounts. Where wh that's why he wasn't running the account uh, with wh I can't the remember the Mohawk her name. Airlines one. Well, no, in the first season, in uh, the the Stein Mart, what was it called? The, the Jewish <laughs> oh, woman. Oh yeah, that uh, Mankins. Mankins. Right, that was that was done, and he really yeah. was ineffectual in that mm -hmm. account at the beginning. He's not going to work in this future world mm -hmm. where he has to deal with with women. 
because his sleaziness works on men, it works on Herb. Uh, NYC Hope is telling me she thought Ken couldn't speak up because Pete's a partner and he's not. I don't know if I buy that. I don't. I don't know. I mean, he. I believe that but Ken he does would not feel empowered to. Yeah, say, but Ken's been known to back down. Like he, someone else would be like, I'm going to write yeah, short Ken, stories if I want to. But yeah, no, he Ken doesn't. Ken rarely speaks up. <laughs> for Ken does yeah. back down easily. Yeah. It, it's true, but uh, he all he would have to say in that particular scenario is she's married. Nobody says, and then later Pete's like, oh, he already knows she's married. But nobody says it. Nobody says it. No and that would be told. the obvious thing yeah, to say. Yeah, because he says, yeah, because it's like, because uh, Herb is married as well. well he's so married too. And then you get married. the adultery, other woman yeah. sort of theme coming up of they're both, you know, sleeping outside their marriage. But, um... I thought I thought that was I thought that was interesting that all all anyone would have to say at any point was no 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 she's a married woman she's not going to do that and then it probably would have ended right there. Also, I thought it was interesting that Pete references that he brought it up again when they were putting him in a cab when they were putting him in a cab at the end of the night. But we don't see that scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably didn't. Right? Did that did that actually happen or is that just an extra? It's sort not of shown, and mm -hmm. Pete said it probably not. <laughs> Um, Guys, let's come back. Let me, let me see what else. What else we? Got oh, you wanted here. to uh, bring up the letter. The, the sorry, the letter. The color green. Oh yes, I do want to talk about what that. What significance? So uh, obviously, Herb gives Joan the emerald necklace and says he thinks this is a good fit for her complexion. Now, I think you could read that as just he actually has observed this about her, which is true because she wears green a lot. So it could be nothing more than well, that. Costume designer Janie Bryant does always purposely put Joan in jewel tone colors. That's fine. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. Um, but ha but, but check, I like costuming. But check this out. Uh, she goes home, and we later see that she's in her gown, still her evening mm -hmm. gown, and she covers it with a green Asian themed Chinese robe mm -hmm. when Don comes over. Uh, again, when they get the phone call from Jaguar that they got the business, she's in a green dress. And if you recall last week when Don was giving his pep talk to the troops, like, you're going to drown in champagne or whatever, also in green. So is there some significance to Joan being associated with the color green? He I mean, gives money, her an jealousy. emerald, which I feel is like the, you know, if she was just clothed in green a lot, it might just be the costume designer thinks she looks, th mm -hmm. this will work well right. for her and this was the style at the time. But you don't write into a script the guy gives her an emerald, which is a notably green jewel, unless it means And he something. says that line about, I thought this would be a good match for Governor. Now, think, when I think red and green, I think Christmas, but I, I don't think. I think it could have been red as like the male gaze, and he's just, a, he's been, you know, he was staring at her and gawking at her, and then made this, uh, you know, made jump to this conclusion, which was accurate, that she wears green a lot. I'll give you it with the stone, but I don't think that her wearing all these outfits in green, that's, that's, mean. Ju that's yeah, that's too far from I mean, too far, really? I mean, well, I, she's just, you see she's that green. That cars. green robe is also a symbol of the ep in the episode, though, because we see her in it, and we believe we take her at face value when Don comes over that she was just I'll about to get in the shower. shower. Well, she was just about to get in the shower. Well, she had but a lot to then wash she off. uses it. She's <laughs> using it to cover what she's been doing. Right. She uses it to cover the fact that she's in an evening gown. All right. So then the, the chat room. Uh, the chat I thought room he thinks, was in there with it. The chat room thinks we're overthinking it, so I will move on. Chat room's with me. But uh, the chat room is with you on this one. But I, I don't know. I gotta say, I, I thought there was point. you have us something. here so we can dig deep. Especially okay. because <laughs> Peggy never in green, always with that mustard yellow, always orange and yellow are Peggy's colors. Earth tones. Mm, yeah. Uh, well, the green is for the money and the gold is for the honey, as Bishop Don Magic Juan is fond of saying. So. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking. Don about. Don Magic Juan. Anyway, he's a he's a pimp. Memorably, it all ties together. <laughs> Um, so. Reference, I have so much to look up on Wikipedia. <laughs> yes, look up the Bishop Don Magic Wand. I'm sure that's exactly what Matt Weiner had in mind when he was writing this. Uh, so what else I want to talk about? Oh, the scene with uh, Freddie Rumson and, and Peggy, which I thought, first of all, fun scene. Great to oh, see Freddie back. Oh, as soon as I saw Joel Murray in the credits, I was like, Freddie Rumson's going Oh, back. I don't, I purposefully don't oh, look because I don't want to know. Well, I, it got blown for me. I forget who came back like last season or early this season, and I saw their name early on. I was like, oh, I know they're going to be in it now. And I kept seeing Alice and Brie come up, and I don't want to yeah. know if there's going to be that. So well, I, I, don't, I don't like Trudy's in the show often, so yeah, I, I don't, don't mind if I see Alice and Brie. But like, if someone who hasn't been in the show in a while, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't look at that. But I, I loved two two things I want to call out. One, I loved uh, Freddie saying car guys are a bunch of creeps, and Peggy goes, they're all a bunch of creeps, which again underlines the the you know we see like we we even see in theater Megan's audition those guys are a bunch of creeps. Mm -hmm. It's basically like you, women can't escape. It's inescapable. Anytime men are in a situation where they ha are evaluating women, yeah. judging women, hiring women, working with women, this is always going to be a, 
Right, it's an audition, it's a callback, it's a very exciting thing, but it's just three guys, like, it's, it's, observing. You can't or, escape. Anytime men are together and this is a, a male position of power, it's this issue Julie is going to Is it Julie crawling across the table? Who's the one yeah. Julie. Yeah, yeah, Julie, Julie Megan's yeah. friend, yeah. Yeah, or even Julie. then. Like, Don't try to just, tame her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. they're right, they're different, they're different uh, Jaguar days. Uh, and the yeah. other thing I thought was interesting, and maybe, I'm sure the chat room might have insight on this, if it goes back into the show's lore, but Freddie's nickname for Peggy is Ballerina? Do we? Do you guys know the origin of that? He calls her ballerina in that scene. Mm. It's right before mm. he says he doesn't, you know, know if she likes to, if she's ambitious or she just likes to complain. But he calls he calls her ballerina like that's his term of affection. For I didn't her. pick that up. Uh, I did chat not. Chat room. I did not. Yeah. If anybody in the chat room has any insights on why he calls her ballerina, I'd be very interested to know. Um, and what did you guys think? about uh, Ted Shaw's Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. He said you have to be a transparent eyeball and let the world pass through you. But I, I mean, when I was when I was watching that, he was like, he, he doesn't assume that she'll be able to figure it out. He goes, what he means by that is this. It's still like a little bit patronizing. And he shows he has the one up on her by giving her a different price. He can't just agree. Yeah. He goes above and beyond. So I, I didn't yeah, really think much of, about it. Like he prefaces it with, what, like, do you even know who, are you familiar yeah. with? Yeah, he's, well, he's a little smarmy yeah. asshole. He's a little yeah. smarmy, yeah. Anyway. But I didn't think about the Emerson quote that much. I almost thought that it, it could have been a little, it almost felt like a little Matt Weiner wink to the audience <laughs> that, you know, like this is, he's, he's passing along what he has seen and observed, and I don't know. I didn't know quite what to make of it. Thought somebody else might have. <clears throat> oh, can we talk about the play that she's auditioning yes, for? Yes, yes, we will talk. We will talk a little bit about the play. I actually have a uh, Little Murders was the name of the play. She says it only once. I heard back from Little Murders. Uh, it started as a Broadway show in 1967. It was written by Jules Pfeiffer, the well-known sort of humorist playwright. This was his very first play. Um, the 1967 version is probably better off for Megan. She didn't get this part. It opened and closed within only a few performances. It was a big flop. Well, we don't know if she doesn't get it. No, she no, shakes she her head. She said she no, doesn't she get it. No, she didn't get it. She says she doesn't yeah. get she it? She tells Don she didn't get it. I thought she was She was just like, how does it go? And she just she looks goes, disappointed. Nah, she goes, I didn't get no. it. Oh, OK. Uh, so, it, but, but anyway, it closed after only seven performances. It was brought back in 1969. Uh, there was a revival that was a huge success. That was directed by Alan Arkin, who ended up oh. making a film in 1971. He directed a film and it, it appears in it as well. Out of the play, uh, it starred Elliot Gould. Let's take a look at a bit of the trailer, Little Murders. Life is full of little problems. Creep. Little annoyances. Little irritations. Police emergency, Sergeant Kirshner. One moment. Little pains. Little setbacks. You don't have to if you don't want to. And little disappointments. Why not? I don't feel like it. Tell you when I feel like it. This is Alfred. Life is full of countless small situations that you either learn to live with or you go bananas. <laughs> It's a very strange sounding play. It's a, the plot concerns a 27 year old career gal, obviously the part mm -hmm. Megan, there's only a few parts, so this was the part Megan was up for. Uh, she lives in New York. It's a New York that is filled, it's comically over the top. There's constant street crime, blackouts all the time. She's getting dirty phone calls all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's this like abstractly horrible, New York City full of perversions and, and it's like just the New York of taxi drivers. It's right. It's this it's this depraved New York City. Uh, and then she saves this very strange, emotionally distant man on the street who's being mugged. That's the Elliot Gould character. Uh, and he's his whole bit is he when he gets mugged and attacked, which happens all the time, he doesn't fight back. He just lets people beat him and mug him on the street. And so she comes in and saves him. Uh, so a strange Oh, a woman helping a, a man who's right. helpless. Yes, and also Obviously. just this image of this New York that is like this hellish New York, like everything that's wrong with the city and all, all the toxic rot smog underneath. Yes, the crazy right. things always happen. It definitely ties in, I think, with the toxic smog New York idea. One more thing I want to mention: uh, we we always talk about how rare the show actually interacts with real, like cast real people. Like before this season, I think Conrad Hilton, we'd agreed, was like the only real character who's been in the show, like a real person. And someone's going to mention that they think. Um, well, we, we have the Timothy Ted, Leary, the, 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 the Leary. Although that was the real Hari Krishna, they definitely did uh, 
include the actual founder of Hare Krishna last week. And I think this week, the middle guy on the couch in the audition scene with Megan is supposed to be playwright Jules Pfeiffer. Uh, I brought a photo. This is the actual Jules Pfeiffer. So if you remember back, I don't have a screenshot. Looks like him. But that dude on the couch is bald and has those big horn room mm -hmm. glasses. Granted, it's sort of a 60s look, but I thought that was kind of a fun little aside that they actually bothered to put like a real guy who looks like I, I bet that's the right. Playwright. I don't think we're reading too much into that. I don't know. The chat room's going to absolutely not, Lon. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's Jules. just a dress. Pfeiffer. Yeah, look up, look up. You know yeah, Jules well, Pfeiffer. He did those really famous cartoons. Those yeah, like I know, but kinda... I'm going to read his whole Wikipedia entry now. I have a lot of stuff to you do. You have a lot of homework. Yeah. Uh, another, another question I had, as long as we're, we're sort of wrapping up uh, at this point. Lane has a very interesting line when he's talking to Joan. And he's telling the story about when he first came on board, he was much more valuable to the company, and he didn't doesn't feel like he didn't ask for enough money to mm -hmm. like he didn't ask for all the money he needs, which is interesting. He says needs because uh, now he's obviously dealing with the after effect of that. But he says every time somebody's asked me what I wanted, I've never told them the truth, and this does not seem like a problem for a lot of characters in Mad Men who are very vocal about what they want. But do you think is Lane being honest about? I mean, is, is he accurately seeing his own problem? Because I feel like. Well, I mean, he hasn't said no. what he—he he hasn't said what he needs. Right. What he wants is the bonuses. What he, you know, he hasn't really. I mean, that's just his British politeness. Well, that's the whole season. <laughs> what was it at the beginning where he gets the number of that girl? He—he's not open with anyone about his real intentions uh, in this. But I don't know if Joan and I don't know if the women in the there are the same way. I mean, has Peggy? Asked for a raise before. Don says you picked the perfect Peggy's time. Peggy's asked to for ask a raise before, and raise. Peggy's very vocal about wanting more. I mean, she asks for counts when she wants them. She says, "I want right. more." And Pete too is in the same situation as Peggy. Of, I'm not getting the uh, response I desire for this. He made a big deal about not having that. Megan's, corner been, office Megan's been very forthright about. I don't want to work here anymore. I want to act. I want to go on to auditions. I want to go to Boston. Yeah, but what about Joe? I think I mean he's saying it to Joan. Has Joan said what she wants? I mean, she she doesn't seem to be clear to the audience of what she wants. I mean, she shows back up at work. She it takes her a while to kick uh, Greg out of the apartment. Um, Roger tries to guess at what she wants. Do you want money for the kid? What do you want? He she really is forthright at, with this season with mm -hmm. anyone except Greg eventually to get out of the apartment. So I don't know. Yeah, it takes it takes Joan a while to sort of get. And she up doesn't the, say much you know. to Lane. I mean, Lane even thinks that he has a chance with her until he tries it, and she yeah. says no. And I think I think we are looking. Elaine said this in the chat room, and I, I agree. I think a, a lot of that was also looking forward to whatever is going to happen to Lane in the next two episodes, which is going to be something. And we're looking forward to what's going to make him finally sort of crack this pressure and this regret. Now we see he's also beating himself up, not for getting into this mess, but for not. It, it, it initially asking for more so he could have avoided the mess altogether, and which also I think implies is uh, it shows his his inability to see things for the way they are, which is that it would it would never be enough. He, he, however much he was making is how much he would probably be spending, and just like a lot of these other characters are already discovered, getting exactly what you want doesn't is not really that meaningful in the long term. Well, then he would get back to his greater desires of wanting his. You know, he kind of doesn't want to be with his wife anymore. They've touched mm -hmm. on this in previous seasons, you know, uh, and his lies about wanting to stay or go for the holidays. If it wasn't money, just like every other male character, every other character, mm -hmm. it would be something else. So I, I think it's the same uh, with Lane. I think it's the same across the pond or over here. But who knows? Lane might be shipped back to England and... Uh, Sterling Cooper, Draper Maybe. Price might have to deal with the fact that it's uh, shorter on well, funds than it thinks. And so on that, I mean, as long as we're making predictions, Alan in the chat room really wants us to talk about the cutting back and forth Don's pitch, yeah. Joan Herb right, scene, the, which, that, that which we'll do. I thought we'd sort of covered it, so I skipped past it, but we, we can go back and talk about that. But as long as we're talking predictions, I want everybody in the chat room to feel free to jump in. Uh, What's how is the show going to deal with Peggy not being in Sterling Cooper anymore? I mean, I guess the few possibilities would be this won't last and she'll come back or everybody will go to where she is or some something that will happen. Or two, we're going to just have this parallel office environment where we're going to follow gonna, yeah. CGC a little bit and see Peggy over there, and we'll follow Sterling Cooper. I think or that's possible. Peggy's just going to be in a, a lot less of the show. I mean, I guess you could have Peggy a Betty a January Jones sort character. of a Betty situation where maybe we'll get one or two Peggy episodes a year, and it's about her interacting with the old crew. No, I think it's going to be B. I think it's going to be a parallel mm -hmm. universe for a while. For a little while. Or, or I mean, the, Daytona, Tracy's throwing I, up, or she could be off the show entirely, which I, I doubt, doubt she's it. too big a character. She but did. I guess it's, it's possible. She's second build. 
It is. I mean, I, I, you, you, on this show, you sort of never know. It's a big enough ensemble that they could drop somebody and the show would go on. But I That's did think true. that they're going to... I mean, they will touch upon it before the season ends, but I don't think that she's going to be... What, I, don't, I don't think she's going to be back next time. We're next episode. Peggy? Yeah. At all? I mean, that would be weird to have episodes now where there's just no Peggy story or know. she's not showing up at all. I mean, I think they will touch upon it before the season ends, but I think we might get a little break from her. Yeah, and uh, I, I think J137 has a, an interesting theory that uh, what if Peggy and Don are at some point rivals for an account? Like, that, that could be a very interesting dramatic setup. Could be. That they're now going to be directed. I see that as a possibility. Well, I mean, she did go work for arguably his primary mm -hmm. competitor and the person he sees as most... Uh, most like a, a sort of rival. Uh, so to go back to the intercut, the editing sequence. Don's pitch, Jones' night, uh, where we're seeing it sort of intercut back and forth, uh, and Don is of course talking again about all these ideas of male desire. Uh, interestingly, I thought one thing that was interesting about Don's speech is he ended up sort of caving. He, he said, we're not going with the mistress thing. It's vulgar, probably turned off by the Jones situation. But you it's don't the same know. thing. Or it could be his, his discussion with Megan, too, where mm -hmm. she pointed out, doesn't that make the car immoral uh, or amoral? Immoral, I think. Um, so you, know, you don't know exactly why. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's, but he's off it. And so then when, even when he's giving the pitch, even though they've sort of backslid and made it into the car as a woman, his examples are still a young boy. Seeing it, it's still removed a lot of the sexuality from the pitch. And it's more just about this notion of unquenchable desire than it is specifically desire for a woman, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think it was done, I mean, it was done for that thematic purpose, as you said, but I think it's also so that we could see Don tell Joan not to do it first. Yes. Before any of that. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I think it was because, you know, we want Don to talk Joan out of it. Uh, I think the audience, I think it makes sense to say, Joan, don't do it. Don's the one guy who's not on board with it. And so that's why it makes sense to have that scene first. And then, well, if we're going to do this little thematic play, then we can put some trickery into here. Mm -hmm. uh, right, yes. The, the, the sort of fake out of he's gotten to her on time, oh no, he's too late. Because at first you think, well, that, that, and that's why I brought up that question earlier, would Joan still have done it? Because the sequence that we see is that uh, Donna's talked to her about it and then she's doing it. Mm -hmm. So we think, oh my God, she decided to go through it every way. And it's, uh, anyway, and it's only later that we find out that yeah. you know, she, she had already been talked to by Don and that's why that question comes up. And I think it's supposed to be a lingering question would Joan have done it had Don spoken to her? Had and if she knew that it wasn't a unified front, not mm -hmm. every partner was on board saying, yes, you should definitely have done this. Uh, an interesting, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, would, would Joan have done it if, she, if Don had gotten to her first? I still think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I that's, that's, so. that's what I, I mean, think, she, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Don, I thought this was a really interesting line Don has at the pitch. He opens with, you must get tired of hearing what a beautiful thing this car is. And, Jamie, you could talk about this a little bit. But it, it, to me, it echoed... Uh, women and their sort of like n un that unwanted male attention of like being stopped on the street, being catcalled, being constantly like women have that too of that they're con being. I feel like someone said that to Joan previously. Like, yeah, oh, you must get tired of people right. saying how and, beautiful and, you and are. And men have men have this sort of idea that well, it's a compliment. What I mean, why would a woman not want somebody to tell them that they're beautiful? You're but asking it, somebody who worked at Hooters for three and a half. I years. know that's so, why I thought so, you would have. Did you get tired of it? Did you get tired of men coming to you? Yeah, I mean, yes, I did. Yeah, but I would. I would. Think I do so. like to be complimented, but no. I you're do right. get tired of it. Like people commenting on my beauty, I sometimes get a little, you know. I, I, yeah, I, other men complimenting your, your beauty? Yes. yes. Sometimes yeah, it, it is it a becomes, little bit off-putting. It becomes tiresome. Uh, yeah, and, I, and I, I thought that was an interesting... Again, everything that Don says pretty much in that pitch has double meaning because it all relates back to what we're seeing full, play out with Joan. So that line in particular, I thought... No, you know what? To be, like, cause I, like, I have, like, I, I'm thinking of like, one specific girlfriend I have who is very beautiful and she hates it. Like, she, like, it's like his people are always telling her, like, oh, your eyes are so beautiful, you're so beautiful. And she just always, like, but she's like, oh, I'm so sick of everyone telling me how beautiful I am. I, w I don't, I wouldn't get sick of it. I, I, you know, I don't, I also remind me, of, I had a, I I had a friend, it. and she used to complain about, and, and, you know, of course, I'm not, I, you know, I don't see this happen, so it never occurred to me, but a lot of guys apparently do that thing where they tell women to smile, like, oh, I, I do hate so that. why don't you give us a smile? I, do. And she I think saying, that's like, in the, I think that's in the game. And then mm -hmm. she would say, like, she just hates, like, it happens all the time, uh -huh. she just hates that. Because you don't know what's 
what's going on with me? Yeah. Don't tell me to smile. You're, you're, right. maybe you're, not, maybe you're not happy right now, yeah. So anyway, that that's just what that... that <laughs> uh, any, anything else about that about that team? I mean, the way it was made, obviously, though, was, was sort of fascinating and gives extra weight to everything that Don is say, saying. You sort of listen more intently because you want to hear what insights he has on what's unfolding in the other sort of storyline. Yeah. Uh, and I, I thought also that scene with Herb, they have him say arguably the most scummy thing he could possibly say, which is, I don't know how much longer I can restrain myself, let me see him. Yeah. And it's just like, ugh, they couldn't have come up with a more skin-crawlingly unpleasant way. He's a disgusting person. He is a disgusting man, and they make him, like, every bit as disgusting. Very makeup streaming down my face. Every bit as it disgusting very, as they possibly It was very emotional. That's so what everyone, everyone said after this episode, just, like, heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think talking about Joan or Peggy, because it's both kind of heartbreaking to see I, Peggy walk out of that office, just like, am I going to be able to see her in this office? Mm -hmm. Because unlike a lot of other episodes, this episode took place very largely inside the office, whereas mm -hmm. a lot of this season hasn't. It was very much like a traditional episode. Like, they have a pitch they have to do. There are these, you know, inner dramas yeah, going lot, on inside like the said, office. Yeah, it was like a first season episode. A yeah. little bit, yeah. And so it, it was definitely heartbreaking. Am I going to be able to mm -hmm. see Peggy in this office again? But of course, Joan's decision is... When I, if, like, I, I watched the episode three times, so I'm surprised. <laughs> but, like, the first time I was so distraught with Joan that, that then the second time I watched it, I was more into, like, the Peggy storyline and then that... Got me. You kind of don't see it come, like you don't. I, I didn't think she was actually going to leave in this episode mm -hmm. when all this is going on. You they take, they were just, like, yeah, they take their time up. with so many things. Everyone was so focused on mm -hmm. Joan when this stuff was going on with her meeting with Rumson, and it wasn't until the even when the Shaw scene was going on, I thought oh, she's not yeah, going to take it. Yeah, she still had a chance. You know, whenever she was with Don at the end and he was offering her more money, she still had a chance to stay. And right. she could have done. And she said, "I'll do my two mm -hmm. weeks," and he said, "No, just leave." No, just like leave. this, which is, is the exactly what he did with <laughs> Megan. Megan the, yeah. did the same thing. She tried to give two weeks, and he's like, "Ah, I got just plenty go. of freelancers. Mm -hmm. Just go." It, 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 basically, it's like leaving him is, is a betrayal, and once it's done, it's done, and he doesn't want to look at you. Yeah. But and he wasn't now. respecting Peggy towards the end anyway. Like, you but know. the two most important women in his life have mm -hmm. left him, essentially. Abandoned him, and in the same way, at this, by quitting that job mm -hmm. and leaving him in the same office, and it's these extreme now feelings of isolation. Yeah, and, and that's how he can control him. Now he, who's he got in the office? Roger? He doesn't mm -hmm. really connect with Roger. He pretends to. And, uh... To go back to the kissing the hand bit again, uh, we already saw him this season, Megan. He's fighting with Megan. He's, he's running around, throwing around the apartment. And then he's on his knees, and she's standing as her grabs her midsection. Mm -hmm. And it's a similar thing. Peggy is standing, and he's sitting down, sort of clasping yeah, her hand. Coward. It's always it's this infantilizing him. If he's a child hanging on to his mom, who, of course, was a, a, uh, a prostitute, which I think it's hard to escape mm -hmm. this episode of the tie-in there. Uh, a few things. Uh, Chubby Werewolf has actually jumped to one of the shots I wanted to talk about. The mm -hmm. very end. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, we're on the finishing stretch. We've only got maybe five minutes left. Uh, we're actually over time already, but I'm, I'm plugging through. Um, there's no bonuses. Cooper said there's no <laughs> bonuses. And everybody leaves the office except Lane. Lane is left in Roger's office. He's got that huge, crazy painting behind him. He's got the bar, and then he just sort of turns around. He's going to go make himself a drink. It was this very, you, you get this feeling that impending doom. Uh, coming for I've Lane. I've been saying this for Lane. It, 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 Lane. Yeah, and I mean, I, I feel like they keep sort of kicking this can down mm -hmm. the road another episode. Maybe it's going to be the finale, but I, I, we've been sort of talking about peak suicidal possibilities. No, I, yeah. I think, I think this one cemented, this shot yeah. for me cemented that it might be Lane that we're There's looking There's a lot at. of doom surrounding both of them, and of course these were the guys who couldn't stop, they had to beat each other up. Mm -hmm. They're both kind of like right. flailing around, and so they're the ones who are getting like violent and trying to assert power any way they can. They've got nothing left. I, I mean, Pete says, I have nothing. Lane is close to having nothing. So. But I agree. I don't know if I brought that up last week, but I definitely thought of that last week as well. Uh, yeah, Lane. Chubby Werewolf was making the point that it's that the way that the painting works is a little, like, abstract. It's a little optical illusion. It's mm -hmm. like you could get lost in it. Wow. I don't know if I... I don't know exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's a little bit of, of a feel. But the whole scene does make Lane feel like this. It was last week, it was just flop, sweat, panic, mm -hmm. anxiety, and now he feels just lost. Like, there's no bottom. That he, he's, There's no way out of this for him. 
Uh, it, I mean, it could happen. There have been dots of Lane this season because he'll disappear for like three episodes at well, a time. Well, it's definitely the next episode because his wife is in the brief. Yes. So we'll we won't get, get Rebecca it. without okay. Lane, probably. Yes. Uh, I loved the moment where Pete misunderstands Joan. She goes, I'm not, making, I'm not guaranteeing results. Yes. And she means, I'm not guaranteeing we're going to get the account. And he reads it as, I'm not guaranteeing that Herb will like orgasm or like that <laughs> he will like enjoy the sex act. Because Pete goes, oh, well, he seems very ardent. I'm sure he'll, uh, and it's just, I mean, I, I'm not saying anything deeper into it. I think it is just in there to lighten the mood a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, but this he's big on, humor. like, there are no positive guarantees. There are only negative guarantees. No, if she sleeps with him, there's no guarantee that we'll get the account. But if she doesn't, it's a guarantee that we won't. Yeah. Like, thing, like there can be definite losses, but no definite wins Yeah. with Pete. And we were talking, too, about, like, the sort of un unsustainability of it. And, you know, like, nothing is sort of for certain, yeah. and it plays on that idea as well. Uh, let me see. Oh, and um, I wanted to talk about, uh, was this the, this is the last thing I'll bring up, and then we'll, we'll close this out, because we're <laughs> over time. But um, was this the first time we've heard a Carson reference? Carson I started so. in 1962, but. Really? Yeah, but this was the first time I, Don actually says, I was going to watch Carson and cry myself to sleep. And then you hear it. Yeah. And then you hear Carson on the back or two. I don't think we've ever heard of Don mm -hmm. being a Carson fan yeah. before. It seems like it might have come up. That's new. I just thought that was interesting. All so Steve references. Allen was done in 1962? 1962, Johnny Carson took over The Tonight Show. I looked it up. Yeah. Wow. Because I was thinking maybe it was very recent, and that's why they made a reference to that's it. That's what like I thought, maybe too. Maybe Carson came on in the last year or so. Uh, but no, no, it was 62. So 30 years then he was on. Long time. Long time he was on. And now Leno's going to be angling for that record. Whatever. With a little <laughs> asterisk because there are a few years in between. Uh, okay, so that is our show. Now we've, now we've moved on to the late night wars. Uh, just so much to cover. I have uh, a lot to talk about with Conan. Yes, yeah, it's true. Uh, thanks everybody in the chat room for joining us. It's been a great week. Lots of brilliant insights as always. Uh, we will be back to Monday. We were on Tuesday this week as the Memorial Day holiday. Back to Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, thanks for joining us, John. I believe Janie will be back next week, but it's been a, a delight having you here. I love being here. It's a lot of fun. At, at Country Caravan, if you want to follow John on Twitter. Please. Thanks so much, Jamie. Thank you, as always, uh, at Jamie underscore Fox. Yes, because, you know, there are a lot of other people with my name. There are, there's <laughs> one in particular, one other dude. Yeah, there's a female in. country singer who has my exact name, exact spelling. Really? Yes. Wow. Well, there you go. See. And then also, it's a, it's the J A I M E yes. thing too. Yes. Okay. So J A I M E underscore F O X. If you want to yeah. find Jamie on Twitter, I'm Lon. But I mostly talk about nonsense. So. Uh, nonsense is good. On don't, Twitter, don't, don't really? Not, don't know nonsense. <laughs> I'm at Lons. If you want to follow me. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us. We will see you next time for another brand new episode of This Week in Mad Men.